guys are in for a feast. Not a regular feast, but a, but a southern feast today by my friend and um, southern food expert, Virginia Willis, who's with us today. Thank you, Robert, so much for having me. I'm so excited. This is so awesome. Remember, you told me about it. I kind of had an idea, but now I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Um, I really want to thank y'all for coming today. This is fantastic. Um, it's just a great opportunity to share this book, which I, I really have to say, and for those of you that are familiar with my other books, I think this is the best one I've done yet. I'm really not kidding. Um, so we have featured some recipes from the book. Um, we're starting out with a Mississippi style char suey pork chicken and you're like, Mississippi? Chinese? What is that? And I'm going to tell you all about it. Um, the chefs here have decided to serve it as an appetizer, so we're serving it on crostini and then drizzled the glaze on top. Um, this next dish here is um, tomato, ginger, green beans. And so it's tomatoes and ginger and green beans and shallot and garlic and a little bit of jalapeno and it's just full of flavor. It's been my get out of the vegetable re recipe for the, for the summer. Um, spicy mac and cheese, which is per perfectly addictive because you know it's hot and then it's got the dairy which cools it, which makes you want more hot, which cools it. I mean, it's just like a cycle, this like terrible, awful, yummy cycle of macaroni and cheese. Um, we have a shrimp and roasted corn. I'm really into um, sustainable seafood, and, and this is a great example of a nice, light summer soup. Um, this next dish here is a garlic rub skirt steak with um, sweet onions and peanut romesco. So I've been teaching this recipe quite a bit. My book launched May 1. And this, um, this recipe came out of an event that I did last fall at the National Peanut Board um, using peanuts. So I grew up in the peanut country. Um, and then we have some sweets, which these are just so beautiful. I'm so excited. Um, See, so these are Dolce de Leche uh, pecan rolls. So it looks like a cinnamon roll, but instead of it being a yeasted dough, it's a biscuit dough. And so it's super easy. It takes us like 10 minutes to throw together. The Dolce de Leche takes a little bit longer, but I also offer up in the head note that you could use a store-bought caramel or you could use a, the, a confectionery sugar, sugar drizzle or anything like that. And then, because life is just better with chocolate. <laughs> so this is a Mexican chocolate pudding. Um, and what makes it Mexican is the cinnamon and cayenne and um, some espresso powder. So this is just rich and creamy. Um, two kinds of chocolate. This is what I call grown-ass woman chocolate. <laughs> and men, grown-ass women, men and women chocolate. And then the cookie that's in the top is a Benny Seed um, wafer. So for anyone that's been to Charleston, South Carolina in any recent memory, um, this is garnished with a, a Benny Seed wafer. So um, I'm glad that Robert instructed you not to eat since 5 o'clock yesterday. And I hope that y'all enjoy my recipe today. And I want to thank the kitchen for doing such an amazing job preparing everything. Hey, everyone. How did everybody like that uh, luncheon today? Tasty? <laughs> and a longtime friend and fan of Melissa's produce. Um, let me give you a little background. So I met Virginia, gosh, about 14, 15 years ago. For some of you, you know about the um, PMA, which is the largest produce show every four years. It's in Anaheim. Next year it's in Anaheim. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys later about that. But anyway, every four years, it's in Atlanta. Uh -huh. and, and every time it was in Atlanta, so I always got to, well, I see her every year at the IECP, which is in the spring, but uh, every four years for the PMA, I saw her in Atlanta because I would invite the La Dame's chapter, uh -huh. um, and, and I was made an honorary La Dame that day, <laughs> uh, because I would give uh, a food presentation about exciting world of produce, you know, right before the PMA started, and, and all the doms from the Atlanta chapter, which I'm all good friends with, uh, go into the produce show and just, you know, explore from there. So, um, unfortunately, Virginia, um, they're not going to do it in Atlanta anymore, the PMA show. Oh, no! I don't know why they said Atlanta Convention Center is too small oh, to host them anymore. I'm not. Wow. Anyway, so. Anyway, with that, uh, Virginia is uh, Georgia-born. She's French-trained uh, chef with one, uh, one of the most respected authorities. In my book, she is an authority on Southern cooking today. Um, and, um, and that is what she does. She is author of five cookbooks now, right? This is the sixth. This is the this sixth. Is the so sixth. She's, yeah. she's, she's going for, what's your goal here? 20, 30, 40, I don't know. Just keep on working. Keep on working. 
And um, in fact, the uh, she won a James Beard one uh, called Lighten Up, Y'all. She was the author of the Cooking with Virginia column on southernkitchen.com. Her articles, she's everywhere in articles. Anytime you see Southern, and the title has to have y'all in it. Uh, Food 52, CNN, Cooking Line, All Recipes, Cooking uh, Country Living, Eating Well, I can go on and on, Chicago Tribune. You're making me tired. I know. <laughs> I'm not going to go through the whole list, but I think you guys all know who she is and how excited we are to eat Southern today. Um, our guest today, Virginia Willis. Thank you so much. I was kind of excited when Robert asked me about doing this, and because um, I have been a long friend. Of Melissa's produce, and I, I used to be the kitchen director for Martha Stewart Living for a period of time. And whenever we had these like crazy out of season, I need peaches with leaves attached. To kids. Hey, Robert, uh, <laughs> trying to get some of trying to get some of that. So it's wonderful. Um, I really want to thank y'all for coming today. This is exciting, and I can't. I had so many comments like, "Oh, I didn't know Southern food was this," or "I didn't know Southern food had so much spice," or "I expected more pork." And it's exactly what I wanted the book to do. So that is it. So mission, you know, mission accomplished. So Secret to the Southern Table, um, as I said at the beginning of the luncheon, I really feel like it's probably my best book. And I'm so proud of it. Um, we, my friend and photographer Angie Mosher and I traveled to 11 states over four seasons to photograph different harvesters and farmers and makers and catchers. We were in Tennessee, Tennessee, all the way east to Georgia. We included Florida and then went as far north as Virginia. Um, and also included Tennessee and Kentucky. And it was just such a, an incredible journey. And then to be able to, to take that journey and to create these stories. Um, so to tell you how I incorporated the stories into the book, the, the, the book is broken down into typical um, chapters, right? Salads, chicken, beef, etc. Um, but I really wanted to um, to share the stories of these of these people, of the farmers and the makers and the catchers. And so I chose two two subjects that were appropriate for the chapter. And the reason I wanted to do this is that I live part time in Massachusetts and I live part time in Georgia, as many of you know from my from Facebook and such. Um, but I, I became apparent to me, starting back with Lighten Up Y'all, um, that people, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people outside the South just don't understand the South, right? They, um, so I, I often say, like, you know, I love fried chicken, and I've got cat head biscuits on the cover, and I think the world would be a better place if we ate more biscuits. Um, but uh, if we were to judge, Southern food is only fried chicken and biscuits, that would be a very one-dimensional view of Southern food. And so, um, so this book is about presenting the unexpected. Uh, and then the other piece of it that I wanted to, like which speaks to the spice part of it, is um, I wanted to share the different cultures and I think that, were, that are within the South. So for a long time, um, there is a perception perhaps that, the, that it's just simply white and black. It's a very homogenous culture. And when I started doing it, I knew it was apparent to me, being in the South, but I knew that it also wasn't apparent to people outside. Um, but for example, there have been uh, Chinese immigrants in the Mississippi Delta since the 1860s. Um, they immigrated from China to theoretically take place of the now emancipated slaves. Right? So they, they, they migrated here, they migrated to Mississippi rather, to work in the cotton fields. And um, some did, and then some stayed and opened grocery stores. There have been Chinese grocery stores in out in nowhere middle of Mississippi since the 1860s. That's just something that I don't think that people conceptualize, right? Um, older, uh, other examples of older populations would be, uh, like for example, there's a huge uh, immigrant Greek population in Birmingham, and they migrated to Alabama in the 1880s to work in the steel industry. And there's a thriving Greek community in Birmingham, Alabama. Now that circle of influence doesn't travel two hours to Atlanta, right? It's just a two hour drive between Atlanta and Birmingham. 
but this, there are these circles of influence all throughout the South. Um, one of my favorites is uh, there was once a direct trade route between Palermo, Sicily, and New Orleans. And so in the 1880s, there were more Italians in New Orleans, Louisiana, than any other part of the United States, including New York City. Wow. Wow. Right? Wow. We don't think, you know, and so if you've been to New Orleans, and you had barbecue shrimp, which had nothing to do with a barbecue grill, and nothing to do with barbecue sauce, it's essentially shrimp scampi, right? Um, if you've been to New Orleans and had a muffalata sandwich, there you are, right? It's the, the Italian cured meat. So there are these older examples of immigration, and then now, um, okay, so after the Vietnam War, there was a huge humanitarian crisis, and a lot of Vietnamese were settled along the Gulf. What, what was not very politely referred to as boat people, we all remember that. There are more Vietnamese in Houston, Texas than any part of the United States except for California. Houston, Texas. Um, there, uh, the, outside of California, the southeast is the fastest growing part of the country in terms of Hispanic immigration. Um, North Carolina has the fourth largest Hmong population. Mm -hmm. And some of the, one of the stories in here, uh, the, as a preserver, uh, maker of jellies and preserves, mm -hmm. um, April McGregor, she uses Hmong farmers in her, in her jellies, right? She uses the produce from them in her jellies. And then I think that one of my favorite stories, um, so let me, let me say this. So I start the book, um, I start the book with a gentleman that some of you may have heard of before. He's got quite a bit of press. I start it with a garden chapter. Um, because I feel like that's where, that's where southern, southern food really starts, okay? We are an agricultural society. It's not quite like the, the, the California here, but we have a 12-month growing season in much of the south. And a lot of the country doesn't have that, so we are uh, mutually spoiled, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But we have something in Georgia, for example, coming out of the ground or off a tree 12 months out of the year. Um, and so... That, compounded with the fact that the South has traditionally been um, one of the poorer parts of the country where people had their own gardens and stuff, true traditional Southern cuisine is an agricultural based cuisine. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the butter and the bacon is, is new, and frankly, a lot of the butter part has to do with television. Right? <laughs> I'll just make note that I have never had bacon wrapped and deep fat fried macaroni and cheese yeah. in my life. <laughs> grandmother is rolling in her grave on the thought of that. Um, but with this book, uh, this, the, this first chapter, I start in the garden, and I start with my friend um, Will Harris, who's the owner of White Oak Pastures. And White Oak Pastures is a fifth generation family farm that was founded when Will's ancestor returned home from fighting in the Civil War for the Confederacy. Okay? Now the other story in that chapter is my friend Matthew Rayford, so let me show y'all Will, though. Let me show y'all Will first, because he's, he's straight out of central casting. <laughs> he's pretty easy on the eyes, right? So this is Will Harris, cowboy. Yeah, right? And he is very passionate about um, his farm and his food. And he used to be a commodity beef farmer, and he is now the largest organic farm in the state of Georgia. And uh, it, he said it wasn't like a burning bush moment. They just realized it wasn't the right thing to do. And so it was this amazing transformation. But Will is fantastic. Will says things like, Virginia, chickens were meant to hunt and peck. Cows were meant to chew. Doesn't that sound like it? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. JJ Venom, yeah. yeah. So he's like, he's very much into the animal welfare. If they take we take care of the animal, the animal will take care of the land, and it will take care of the people. And then, so the other gentleman that's in this um, in the in this chapter is my friend Matthew Rayford, whose family farm was founded. His family farm was founded when his ancestor was emancipated from slavery. Well, right? But these are two centennial farms. And that is where I feel like Southern food really starts, and then I branch out from there. So I, I have a story about the Vietnamese shrimpers in Texas. Um, I have a story about a commodity rice rice farm in Louisiana. I also have a story about Anson Mills, which is an airline producer um, out of South Carolina. Um, mm -hmm. So it was my intention, and you know, I think it's reflected on the mm -hmm. cover and the brightness, to paint the brightest, richest possible cookbook 
that I could about what the South is and what Southern food is. So I have a combination of traditional recipes, but as you taste it here today, there's a lot that aren't traditional, right? Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just really thrilled. And then, and at the end of the day, I'm a cookbook writer and I write recipes. And so what I've tried to do is to include recipes that are accessible to normal people. They're not like super chef driven. I mean, I can cook like that, but, but a lot of but people want accessible and easy and tasty and good, right? That's what, that's what modern life is. And so for those people that have a little bit more time and effort and energy, you know, there's other directions to go, but um, I just try to, uh, you know, I remember I worked for Martha Stewart for a long time, so I know, I know what it means like to mail order things and to <laughs> obscure ingredients, and I, I appreciate Martha, don't, don't get me wrong, she's always, she's always been a huge supporter. Um, uh, and the other, but the other thing is that's really quite funny is I have spent, I've put together this compilation of these recipes and y'all the South is different, y'all the South is different, y'all we've got this, we've got that, and everybody until today has wanted me to make biscuits. <laughs> Martha Stewart Test Kitchen biscuits, Family Circle Test Kitchen biscuits, uh, uh, Food and Wine Test Kitchen biscuits, but you know what, I will make, I will make biscuits for people, I will definitely make biscuits for people. But today I'm going to make green beans for y'all. So. Really uh, bright, as you can see. This is the, the one that you tasted for lunch. So um, it is a combination of garlic and ginger and shallots, and um, and I love it. And I started teaching. So the, the book launched May one, and I've pretty much been on the road nonstop since then. Um, it's been it's been uh, awesome and a bit tiring, but so I feel so fortunate. You know, I just feel so fortunate. Um, to be able to do this. And um, one of the things that's come up as, the, as I have been teaching this recipe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that mom to call it to check on me? No. <laughs> uh, but this, this, so this is essentially like a very flavorful uh, tomato concasse that we fold in um, blanched green beans. Um, but what I've realized as I've been teaching this is that we could use, of course, many other vegetables. You could use um, charred asparagus or, or broiled asparagus or grilled asparagus, um, blanched broccoli. The, the, most vegetables would have to be blanched, but also like sugar snap peas. I think sugar snap peas just like folded into this would be wonderful. Um, I'm going to show you all a couple. I know that many of you know all these cooking techniques. Some of you are cutting techniques. Some of you may not. And of course, some of the folks on Facebook Live may not. So. Um, so the first thing I want to do is, this is one of my favorite things. This is called the box cut, and this is a great way to, um, to chop a pepper. So what I do is I simply pull off the sides, and then that way we don't have to see the pepper. Right? So just like that. And that goes away. This goes to your chickens or your compost, or you can shellac it and make it a Christmas ornament, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's another show, really. All right, and then I'll just take the uh, take the, the pith out here in the center. And of course, you can do any pepper like that, like a bell pepper, obviously any of them. And then I'm going to go back across and cut into strips. And I'll just line up my... Um, Faye was asking me, um, I, am, uh, I am a classically French trained chef. I went to school at L'Academie de Cuisine in Bethesda. And, um, and then I attended a Cold de Cuisine Lover in France. I was supposed to be in France for three months, and I was there for three years working with Anne Willen. And, and everyone's always like, oh my God, did you fall in love? I'm like, yes, with France. <laughs> but it's a no-brainer there, isn't it? Um, so I've got my, uh, my um, jalapenos lined up, and fingers bent, thumb tucked. You only don't tuck that thumb once. Okay. Perfection. Uh, one's a little big. There you go. Okay, now one's there. You go. When I was, when I was in culinary school, we would be we would be um, uh, judged on our culinary, on our cook cutting techniques, on our knife skills. You know, whatever didn't make didn't really make the cut it was a snack. You know, just eat, eat that bad carrot, right? Eat your mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Eat your mistakes. Um, and then I've got the garlic. And what I'll do is I'll just take off this um, this tough stem, and then I'll have it. 
And if it is has a little green sheet in there, I usually take that out. Although I did this in front of Anne not too long ago, and she's like, what are you doing? Um, so I'll take that little green sheet out. And then what I like to do is put it near the board so that my knife will go completely flat. And smash it. There you go. <laughs> that just makes you feel good. It makes me feel good. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I just going to take a little bit of salt and put over it. And that's going to act like an abrasive. I'm breathing into the microphone. Act like an abrasive. And then if I wanted to, I could take the my knife and use it like a power knife and make it really, really, really small. I'm going to put this with um, the garlic. And then in terms of ginger, what I, I don't know if it's lazy or what, but we could go with lazy. Um, if I scratch the skin and it's thin enough that it comes off easily, I don't peel my ginger. Why not, right? Why? I mean, I wash it, obviously. Um, not that lazy. Is that the southern way? Sir? Is that the southern way? It's the Virginia way. <laughs> <laughs> no. They grow ginger, and um, there's a lot of ginger being grown um, in the low country, in Savannah, in that area, because we are subtropical. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that area of the world is definitely subtropical. And if you go there in the next couple months, you will understand. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone going on vacation to Savannah, Georgia, or Charleston, mm -hmm. The heat index last weekend in Charleston, I was there with Natalie Dupree. She was texting me and we had a party. The heat index on Saturday was 110, 110 degrees. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, and y'all got that humidity. You know, I don't care about the humidity part. 110 is hot. Period. Yeah, 110 is hot. So I'm going to just slice this ginger. Same sort of thing. What I'll do is I line it up. And then I uh, go back and chop it. So, um, and then the last ingredient that I want to show is the tomato. And, and the, one of the statements during the luncheon earlier was that they didn't, folks didn't realize that southern food was so hot. And there is there there is some heat, of course, um, but I feel like it's also just like more more modern, right? But peppers certainly grow well in the South. And on that note, though, people say Southern food. If we think about Southern food, Sean Brock wrote, wrote my forward and he writes this, the South is one million square miles. That's huge. So the food of the coastal Carolinas is different from the food of coastal, the Gulf Coast. We have two coasts, right? We have the Gulf and the Atlantic. So the food from Louisiana is different from the food of Charleston. Heck, the food of Louisiana is different from the food of Mississippi, right next door. Um, the food of the Deep South, Alabama and Georgia, is different from the food of Tennessee. So there's a lot of, it's, it's, and Sean says this, and I think it's really appropriate. We don't say, oh, I love European cuisine. We say, I love French food, or I love Italian food. It would be really the same thing. It's a, it's a, it, it's a very hyper-regionalized um, food. And if you don't think that, just look at the different styles of barbecue sauce, right? I mean, barbecue sauce is really super obvious. Yeah, Carolina is mustard. Georgia is like a tomato vinegar. North Carolina is almost purely vinegar. Alabama uses mayonnaise, which is so good. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. And I only met it a couple of years ago. It's called Alabama white sauce. And it is essentially mayonnaise with a lot of pepper in it. It's really good. All right, so... I say in this recipe that you should seed your tomatoes, and I know that a lot of home cooks wouldn't do that. But what, what you can do, of course, is just give it a gentle squeeze or, or use your, your finger just to remove the seeds. And you know what? Obviously, if you don't want to seed your tomato, then don't. Just don't do it. It's okay. Um, but these beautiful tomatoes, and I love those. Um, Y'all will get some in your little packet. They've got some gorgeous heirloom cherry tomatoes. Um, the tomato that I suggest to use is the one that's the ripest, right? That's that's the way to go with them. All right, so let's see what's happening here. All right, so to start with, yeah, isn't it funny? Everyone, um, when you turn on the glass, they be like, put your head down. Is it on? Is it working? 
Um, <laughs> it's so silly, right? <laughs> Get super close. Okay, and then um, we can use olive oil or canola oil. I use a lot of canola oil. Um, honestly, I feel that um, it lets the flavor of the food shine through, right? It's a, it's a light oil without not a whole lot of flavor. And um, I'm going to let that get hot. And yeah, these are the cherry tomatoes. If I were doing this with these, I would just have them. Mm -hmm. You know, I might use one. Yeah. <laughs> you can do this dish with okra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love okra. Yeah. I, um, we talked about it yesterday because I did a, an appearance on a on Home and Family yesterday. And, um, one of the dishes I did was an Indian-inspired spicy fried okra. And I wrote a book a couple years ago about okra. And I would be talking about the book, and people were like, oh my god, did you get to meet her? And I didn't know what they were talking about. I know, okra, not okra. Okra Winfrey. Oh my god. That might be my alter ego. Okra Winfrey, that would be fabulous. <laughs> anyway, okay, cool. So um, I'm gonna get the, my shallots going. And if you, if you wanted to use a different um, allium, you could, of course. Um, a sweet onion, any kind of sweet onion. All right, and then I'm going to get the jalapeno in and the garlic. I'll let this cook just a bit. But other chilies, obviously serrano would be nice. Just something with a little kick. And the great thing about this recipe is it, going back to that 110 heat index. This recipe can serve um, warm, fresh off of the skillet. It could be served uh, room temperature. It would be a great room temperature dish. In fact, we're having a party next weekend for 100 people, and it's going to be a great room temperature dish. <laughs> like, Lisa and I are throwing a party, and it's all of a sudden, it's like, I've, I've been traveling, and it's like, uh, a week later, and she's like, I guess this is at 100. I'm like, wow, you've been busy. <laughs> so, um, and then um, I'm going to put the tomato in. And, uh, and then lastly, this dish would be great for cold, right? Mm -hmm. The only thing I would suggest, if we served it cold, would be to obviously to adjust the seasoning with salt and pepper you know, before you serve it because 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 it's cold dull the seasoning. So and then the garlic in and I just like to put garlic till it's fragrant like 45 to 60 seconds. And then I have my um, blanched green beans, which these are so beautiful. And uh, I love how y'all package these because they leave that beautiful little tip on. It's so pretty, so pretty. We eat with our eyes. And this is it. The green beans and those, um, those beautiful tomatoes. And we can add a little bit of cilantro at the end. And I'm going to season this with a little bit of salt and pepper. And I just add the green beans until they're heated through. Once again, you can use broccoli, asparagus. Salt and a little bit of pepper. And there we go. Doesn't that smell good too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, pretty. Yeah, so pretty. Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot.
someone else cook my recipes. It's right. just like the most touching thing, especially like people that, um, like, like I did a Facebook Live with Jenny Fields not long ago and cooking along and stuff. It's just really, it's an honor for someone to take the time and energy to do someone else's recipe and to spend the money and to go to the grocery store and all that. So this recipe is with um, skirt steak. You could use flank steak. Um, what I what I just try to do is a sort of an inexpensive cut. If you wanted to do the romesco with a with a tenderloin or something like that, you could. Whoop, there's my mom. Um, all right, so same sort of thing. So what I suggest for people with this recipe, unless they make the romesco ahead, is to um, Start marinating the steak. So we'll just do that same trick with the garlic, right? And it's just simply garlic and olive oil. And we'll just sort of slather that on there. What's the minimal time for, or what's a good time to be able to marinate before you start cooking? It's just 30 minutes, because it's really, it's just flavor. I mean, it's just a little, there's nothing to penetrate this meat. So really like 30 minutes or so. So get that going. And I want to show you one thing about the onion that I've kind of figured out lately, which I'm real happy about. So you know, if you have, oh, I often say the only time you need onion rings is if you're making onion rings. You know, it's, really, it's really an unsafe way to chop an onion, to have these rings. Um, so, but, uh, but if we're grilling this, and we have the onion, then it's very likely to fall through the grates. So, I sort of adapted this technique from um, how I cut butternut squash. You know, butternut squash is really hard to cut through. So I insert the knife into the onion, and instead of just trying to force the knife through the onion, I rock the onion back and forth. So just sort of firmly, firmly pressing on it, and that way it's just an easier and safer way to, to chop it into rings. So once again, so not just forcing this through, but sort of rocking that onion. And that's the same way I cut the stem of the, 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 the meaty part of the butternut squash. Love right? Love it. Yeah, I mean, so. All right, and then the last one, let's go like that. So this would sort of marinate for, say, like a half an hour. And then I have the romesco, which Robert tells me this is the, this is their most popular dark product, the roast red peppers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, they're delicious, so they should be. Um, okay, now you're going to have to help me dry this, because this is, this is an unfamiliar animal. You know, I'm, I'm like, so I'll put the jarred peppers in, and I have peanuts. So the recipe doesn't specify salted or unsalted. What kind of peanuts do you have in your cupboard? That's the kind of peanuts that you want to get. My opinion about salted nuts is you can salt and things like that. You can always add salt. It's hard to take it out. But with peanuts, um, you know, whatever ones you have to eat. And then a piece of toast. If you wanted this to be gluten-free, I would just simply leave it out. I wouldn't try to put in gluten-free bread. And I've got some big, beautiful pieces of garlic. Smoked paprika. Let's pretend this has happened for half an hour. <laughs> All right, you guys can smell my griddle. I mean, it's always take a little bit longer than you think you're going to take, right? We'll just season this with a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper. So I ate at Jelena last night, and I was so excited to see all the different vegetable treatments. And I had some of the best okra I have ever had, which when I texted my friend, she's like, that's pretty significant. <laughs> so I was excited to see it. A lot of people don't like the slime with okra, and the way to solve that is um, to not cook it so long, and then also a tomato product or an acid helps minimize the slime. And, um, and then also frying it. And the book, in the book that I wrote about okra many years ago, and I speak to this in Secrets of the Southern Table, is um, everywhere that's hot, okra thrives. It's a, it's, a, it's a very hot vegetable. It grows in a very hot climate. And also, um, it's been uh, pushed around the world through slavery. OK? 
okay, because it, it originated in West Africa. And so that's sort of where it, it traveled throughout the world. There's, and then, um, one of, yes, there's Greek okra, Iranian okra, um, Indian okra. All right, and some cherry wine vinegar. And then I have some tomato paste, or tomato puree, rather. Now this sauce, you had it on your steak, you had it on your steak. Um, it's also fantastic as a dipping sauce. And um, one of our vegetarian friends today, she said that she made a crostini with the romesco and just some of the grilled onion. Um, I served it last week at an event um, as a dipper for shrimp. Obviously it would be a great dipper for vegetables. I just like the fact that it's just something a little different. It's a dip that's on a mayonnaise or a sour cream base. Um, it tastes great with this real full flavored steak. It also tastes good with like grilled chicken and grilled seafood. Um, so the chimichurri. Um, get some nice marks there. It smells delicious. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let that cook a bit and I'm going to add my olive oil. In a slow, steady stream. Wow. <laughs> it just comes off the tongue so easily. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm so used to cuisine, right? You're like, so used to what you're used to. There you go. Awesome. 
So some of the, um, so what I'm trying to do is uh, some recipes that are like this, like the accessible green beans or just like family friendly meals. Um, we, so my photographer, Angie Moser, she was a photographer for Lighten Up Y'all and she also did the Hero Shots in the book. And another thing that we tried to do just to sort of, I, I can be a bit OCD when it comes to building the books, it's just what I love to do. So we have the, the travel shots, obviously, um, but for like the hero recipes, the hero um, shots of the food, uh, there's, a, there's 80 recipes in the book and over 70 of them have photographs attached, so there's that. Because that's what people want, and people want to see it. And it blogs of what has led to that. Because if I can look at a blog and see a picture, why would I buy a cookbook that doesn't have one? So that is one great way it's changed. But one of the things that we did was we actually photographed everything. We would print a copy of the photograph and put it, print a copy of the picture and put it on the wall because I wanted to make sure that I had all of the primary colors, I had all the primary colors reflected in the book. So every chapter has red, yellow, green, blue. And I also made sure that every chapter had the corner of a table because it's about the table. It's all about coming together at table. And um, just really, uh, the HMH, it was, a, it was a beautiful team, like really assembling this. Um, so, let's see, what, let's check out our stick. I'm going to let this rest for just a few minutes. And turn my Oprah over. Oh, that looks awesome! <laughs> Um, this is technically not recipe development. <laughs> it is. You come back anytime. I'm going to be more than happy to. This is awesome. Okay, so we may have to rush this a tab. But we'll put the uh, from that. May I please ask you for a spoon? Um, so the just trying to present that unexpected piece. The uh, the average farmer in the southeast is a 57 year old white male. And I don't have a thing against 57 year old white men, not at all. But that's not the farmer that I wanted to show. So my two farmers in the book, one is um, one is a couple that are high school sweethearts that were um, that have a farm right outside of Hartsville, Jackson, the world's busiest airport. Right? So the other farmer in the book is a wonderful woman, her name is Diane Flint. <coughs> And she um, she is uh, has become one of the premier um, heirloom apple authorities in the country, and she's a former banking executive. So it's really just trying to. Um, that might be a little rare here. Let's see if we can do it. So obviously, y'all know this, or many of you do know this. The grain is running this way, okay? So I want to cut against the grain, and I'm cutting at a pretty sharp angle. And I'll get my green beans. I have my green beans back. <laughs> I'm telling the country. <laughs> Might I have the green beans? Pass the green beans, please. <laughs> so we'll remesco on the plate. And then some green beans. And y'all, if y'all are doing social tagging, I know you've got it all, and I've given it, it everybody, hopefully given all of y'all a card, and if you don't have it, please let me know, and um, I'll answer some questions in a minute, oh, that over looks awesome, <laughs> tomatoes, just grilled onions on top, that how about that for Southern food? I won the social media contest for today and I got this wonderful tropical fruit basket with uh, wine. So it's got like rambutan, I see some chamoya, kiwi, passion fruit, dragon fruit, all kinds of beautiful stuff. It'll remind me of home. Thank you, Melissa.